what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have uh, Dima Buterin, and I'm going to formally introduce Dima in a second. Uh, Dima, thanks for joining me. Um, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. If you're watching the video, there is a reason we have gate.org up in a second. So you will go over that, which is says on here, the number one way to help Ukrainians donate directly to families. And we'll go over that in a second, but some cool, you know, this episode, Dima is about, you know, changing the world essentially, you know, with what you've done, with what your family has done. And so other episodes I feel like are on the same realm as I had Moise Navone of Mobileye. Um, and he talks about Mobileye and their journey to get acquired uh, by Intel. Uh, for $15.3 billion. And, and they're fuel, fueling the autonomous vehicle, um, you know, movement. Um, and it was really amazing. But there's sacrifice along the way, right? He talked about how his he had to go back to his family at, one, at several points and tell the kids and wife they're pulling them out of all extracurriculars. There's no more eating out. There's no more niceties because there's ups and downs of a company. Um, you know, we talked to the co-founder of Pixar, LV Ray Smith, same thing. You know, he talked about Steve Jobs and George Lucas, but there was a lot of ups and downs in that story. It's not just all sunshines and rainbows and um, many, many more. Uh, we met because of Jason Gaynard. So a big shout out to him. I remember uh, we were sitting at one of the, the mastermind talks and you were telling me, about you're like my son he's going to be in time magazine and we're going over to russia and i'm like who is this like what is that you, know, you were telling me how old your son was at the time yeah. how old was he when he when he was in time i mean he was in a bunch of uh, publications right i mean yeah. uh, he was on the cover of time magazine i guess recently yeah right like uh, but you know in terms of being in Time Magazine, maybe he was around 21, I don't know. Yeah, Amazing, amazing. Um, so I'll formally introduce Dima in a second. You know, like, wh what, are, what are they talking about here? But um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Dima, just like Jason, um, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. I found no better way to do that over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and have them on my podcast and shout from the rooftop so everyone else knows what they're working on as well. Um, so if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. You can email me personally, uh, Jeremy at rise25.com if you have any questions. And today, um, you know, I'll, there's so much to go into with your bio, um, but founder of three multi-million dollar businesses, including top-ranked membership management software company Wild Apricot. I worked with Andrew Warner at Mixergy for many years. There is an interview that goes back to 2010 of you um, talking yeah. about it. And and Wild Apricot served over 20,000 nonprofit organizations. Um, he was also the co-founder of Block Geeks. Um, with Amir Rosick, who I know as well. And then also he's an angel investor and just a mentor for blockchain startups and proud father of three, one of which we just talked about, Vitalik Buterin, who's the creator of Ethereum. So Dima, right thanks on. for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Awesome to be here with you. Let's start with, we'll start with this nonprofit mm -hmm. for a second, but take me back to the Soviet Union where you grew up and what it was like. You know, when you grow up, you don't really think globally, if you will, right? It's uh, your world is really about your family, about your friends, about your school. And as you grow, then you kind of get the more nuanced picture of the world, right? Like, and one of the things for the Soviet Union, a few things I want to mention is like, one, it was definitely very isolated, right? It was like 
there's a lot of propaganda like from i don't know six years onward it was all about we are building communism and uh, we are good the rest of the world is bad and uh you know, Lenin is a hero and all this bullshit, right? So there's a lot of propaganda and a lot of uh, just uh, we are good versus the rest of the world is bad. And it's really fascinating to watch Russia rapidly decelerating back into the medieval times and all this bullshit right now. Like, it's it's really hard for me to, to believe that this is happening, but it is, yeah. Um, also for me, like growing up in the Soviet Union and seeing the attempt at uh, doing everything in such a centralized manner for such a huge, huge country, right? Like, and seeing the total failure of that, like their their commerce, their economy, their healthcare, everything was really messed up. Like, you know, so uh, all the buildings, like just the whole economy, it's like trying to do things in a centralized fashion doesn't work. I mean, that definitely got me firmly convinced in that. Um, yeah, but outside of that, end of the day, it's really as why we did grow you, up, it's about DM, yeah. why did you um not buy into the propaganda? There's people who do buy into the propaganda, right? Oh, I, I bought into that too, like originally, right? But eventually kind of I got to see their uh how fake it is, you know, I guess by the time I was a teenager, right? And I was pushed to like uh, in Soviet Union, there was this whole ladder of things. Like first you own this like a communist scout kind of movement. Then you in this next level thing, then you go into this Komsomol, which is like a youth communist movement, all this bullshit. Then you go to the actual communist party. So basically by the time I I was supposed to go into this stage three, this pre-communist party, I'm like, no, this is bullshit. I don't want to join this bullshit, right? Because I could see that it's all really about pretense. People just, you know, parroting stuff without anybody believe in that and really just like trying to pursue their personal goals by leveraging that. Um, and uh, th- it was a time when Soviet Union was breaking apart and it was possible then because before that it was like, okay, you either go there or you kind of lose your prospects in terms of going into good, you know, university in terms of getting a good job and stuff like that. But, you know, so as the Soviet Union was falling apart, it was also becoming more and more obvious that, uh, how fake this whole structure was what made you move then because you then you moved to to toronto yeah i moved 23 years ago i mean bunch of things uh some personal circumstances some curiosity about kind of like living outside of russia uh also some doubts about where Russia is going to go with Putin, who just came into the power in 99. And that's when I left Russia. And I was very suspicious of what's going to happen. And like, my God, in my, in my worst dreams, I could not have imagined their nightmare that it would drive Russia to. So, yeah. I mean, it's a huge leap. I mean, not just some people move, you know, let's say we're in the United States, you move to a different city, moving to a totally different country is a huge decision. What was that transition like to when you moved to Canada? Um, you know, it's a challenge, right? And uh, you get in this new environment and you kind of don't understand so many things about this. Like, for example, the checking account. What the hell is a checking account, right? Like, you know, those basic things. Well, that's like what I mean. Cash. It's like simple things right. yeah. that people take for yeah, granted. Yeah. I mean, they're... The good thing was that I already uh, had, my English was pretty good, so that was not a problem. Um, also, I had some savings and I didn't have to look for a job. And actually, uh, just as I moved, I started, uh, I co-founded a startup with my friends from the US, my ex-colleagues from uh, one of my early jobs. And so it was a dot-com year. So like I, I had things to do, right? So kind of like, there was a bunch of uh, things that made it easier. But yeah, it was also pretty challenging, basically, starting from scratch, building the network of connections and friends. And uh, I was very much like uh, into networking and read a lot of books. And like by my nature, I mean, I don't really say that anymore, but, you know, like I'll say that I'm an introvert, uh, which is a bullshit story, but that's, that's how I used to think about myself. And so then I pushed myself to join all kinds of 
authorizations and go to networking meetings and stuff. And that actually did pay off uh, quite uh, significantly in my uh, establishing my roots here. You know, um, I mentioned at the top of the interview, three multi-million dollar businesses and Wild Apricot. Where did Wild Apricot fall in that? Was that the, the third of the three? Yeah, it was a very last business in my uh, career that I co-founded and uh, uh, built it, uh, I guess, uh, over about 12 years before we sold it. What was the original idea behind Wild Apricot? Why nonprofits? Um, we had a, basically a custom web development shop, if you will, and we're serving all kinds of clients and uh, also doing some pro bono stuff for some small nonprofits. And we realized that hey, there are lots of these little guys and they have nowhere close to like uh, money being able to spend a few grand on the software they need. But in fact, they have lots of similar needs. And we, the whole concept of software as a service was just being born. It was, I think we started that in 2006. And uh, so it's like, okay, hey guys, why don't we try to do that? And that's into building the software and then try to sell it to lots of small organizations as a subscription. And uh, it did work out quite well. What was it, what was it gave you the biggest traction on more um, customers for that? I mean, like you said, you're like, yeah, they don't have much money. You know Let's Customer go after that referrals. niche, right? Yeah. yeah. We actually, we, because the software was very inexpensive, like on average, we're getting paid like, I don't know, 50 bucks a month. Um, and uh, so, which is obviously for business, it's peanuts, but for a small nonprofit, so for some of them, it was quite substantial because they basically were running on tunes and volunteer power. Um, and uh, so it took a very substantial investment uh, for us to, to build that software, right? But it was also very rewarding. And I would say, and we tried to different approaches to acquiring customers. Uh, and one thing that never worked on win is the sales. And we built the business up to about 10 million uh, annual run rates uh, simply by online marketing and by a lot of focus on customer service and customer referrals. So customer referrals was always our major channel. You obviously have a lot of expertise in nonprofits. And let's talk about gate.org, the gate to the yeah. Ukraine. How'd you get involved? What's it, what's it about? Um, a friend of a friend referred me to this uh, initiative, and uh, it came uh, through uh, this guy in Chicago, Alex Zatvor, who is a member of EO. I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, Entrepreneurs Organization. Mm -hmm. And I was a member of EO for 13 years, I believe. So, And I, I have a lot of respect and love for that organization. Uh, so kind of got connected with Alex, and, and because I, I, I do follow the events uh, in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine quite closely. And I'm involved with a number of initiatives already, uh, helping the Ukrainians, helping the Ukraine. And uh, so which when I looked at that, I was really impressed with how much energy, how well organized they are, right? And also the mission they trying to, because uh, they basically trying to, they fundraising the money and then they are funneling it directly to uh, suffering families in Ukraine. There are millions of them now who basically, with this in invasion, they lost everything. All, they lost their homes, they lost their ability to earn money, and uh, they are really uh, totally in uh, an unbelievably tough situation. So this uh, organization specifically sends uh, targeted small donations to specific families. Uh, so and they really that really resonated with me. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Uh, I mean, you've helped at this point probably um, help raise millions of dollars for this uh, cause. And I'm wondering what you've seen personally um, from following it so closely. And yeah, I was actually at an event with Alex um, this past week. So he's just an mm -hmm. awesome guy. So um, what have yeah. you seen following it so closely? And also that you know, your, roots, your, your, uh, your roots go back to there too. Yeah, for sure. Like, I grew up in the Soviet Union. Ethnically, I'm Russian. I do have a significant proportion of Ukrainian blood in me, like many Russians do. Uh, also, I grew up in a city called uh, uh, Chech uh, Grozny in Chechnya, and uh, that region tried to uh, 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 succeed from Russia back in 
whatever it was, 93, I guess, and Russia waged two brutal wars and totally destroyed that city. So I kind of watched, if you will, firsthand, like, you know, the way the Russian empire dealt with uh, their, its, uh, you know, neighbors and uh, the territories that it, uh, it's uh, gathered over the centuries. So, so for, uh, for me, kind of like watching how, what they did in Ukraine, what they still doing in Ukraine was uh, really horrifying and uh, also brought a deep divide with a bunch of uh, people I still knew in Russia, like, you know, my classmates basically are telling me that uh, I should be damned to hell and uh, should die a horrible death. I'm a traitor of Russian motherland because I support Ukraine. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> This situation brought me closer with my son, Vitalik, who also uh, uh, became very vocal about his uh, support for Ukraine and uh, his opposition to this uh, crazy war. So, yeah, I mean, like I have lots of friends in Ukraine. I'm involved with a few organizations and uh, uh, I've donated a chunk of money of uh, my own and uh, will keep donating. I, I am supporting my Ukrainian friends and connections. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a subject close to my heart. Let's talk about Vitalik for a second. He comes to you. He wants to drop out of college. Yeah. He came home. I mean, I do remember the day. Uh, and uh, he brought it up. Uh, and uh, it's funny because uh, uh, all three of us, me, uh, my wife at the time, his stepmom, and uh, his mom, where she was also at our house. And he came over and he said that, uh, Hey guys, I'm thinking about dropping out of college, and we all had a very similar reaction. We kind of we supported him, right? Because uh, for me personally, it was very obvious that you know he's obviously a very smart, uh, amazing human being, and he will succeed no matter what. And yeah, I mean, he can finish that wonderful university, get a wonderful job at Google, Apple, whatever, make good money, and him dropping out would probably. Uh, make his life, if you will, more difficult versus just like, oh, get an education and then the job. But also I knew that he would learn much more and uh, uh, hopefully uh, he would become much more resilient human being too. And that's that's pretty much what happened. So yeah, I mean, we all supported his decision. There was no doubt in many of us. What did he want to do at the time when he said, I want to do um, something well, else? He wanted to um, travel. For, for a bit and that's what he did and he also wanted to spend more time on a bunch of crypto projects that he was uh, being involved in and uh, and specifically you know their idea of Ethereum was kind of I guess it was somewhat in its uh, you know being born around that time maybe a little bit later what was you introduced him early on to to Bitcoin and some of these concepts what were those early conversations what was your thoughts at that time um, and what were the conversations like? Um, I have a very curious mind. And for me, when I discovered Bitcoin, I, I didn't, I have to say that I didn't pay much more attention to that than that being a very cool project and kind of for technical curiosity, because it was clear that, oh, wow, well, that guy or some people behind it. So they really brought together a whole bunch of other concepts to come up with a totally new, different concept of uh, managing money, right, without relying on any kind of uh, centralized uh, institution, right? And uh, on the one hand, I was impressed with the power of uh, thinking through the technologies, the algorithm behind it. But then also, like, if you will, it was my Soviet background and uh, my general distrust toward anything centralized. I felt like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense to try to go away from a centralized approach to managing their monetary you know instruments uh, to doing it in this way and you know then we had a whole bunch of conversations i mean we had some conversations but uh uh it really piqued vitalik's interest and uh he uh, he uh, got more and more involved and you know him being my son i was definitely because of that was paying more and more attention for a while for a couple of years i guess he was a co-founder and writer of this bitcoin magazine uh, editing and writing lots of articles and I still have lots of those uh, magazines actually uh, lying around here at my place so, you know I read a lot of his articles I love it I could see like a, a signed copy from to his dad signed copy of Bitcoin magazine yeah. uh, for you I love <laughs> it what was what was it um, at that time 
the landscape, um, you know, because obviously he's writing. Is that did that magazine go online at some point or what, what happened? It was actually very interesting because they did launch it as a print publication, right? Because and for me back then, like, that was a very unusual decision because obviously launching a print publication is very expensive proposition, right? Versus like uh, things seem to go online and they were kind of going there in the opposite direction. But so I guess that they had their reasons and uh, it was a glossy, very well produced, you know, high quality print magazine. And uh, that was very interesting, uh, un unexpected. Uh, and basically uh, back then that was, I guess, like 20, 11 2012 around that time 2013 maybe early um it was obvious that bitcoin is a technology that is succeeding and uh now when you know after its initial success then uh, this is what we humans do we always look at this and like oh how can we now leverage that in a different way how can we improve that so a lot of their writing and discussion it was really about okay so this is awesome that bitcoin is doing this for money okay can we now use it for stocks for real estate can we do this can we do that like what if we change this parameter can we build a better bitcoin stuff like that so it was really the era of initial experimentation i want to hear what you see ethereum being used for now in the future but i want to talk about the bitcoin magazine for a second like this is what i picture <clears throat> Dima is you know, the PayPal syndicate, like all those people went on, not all of them, but many of them went on to, to start amazing companies and do amazing things. Was it similar with the, the Bitcoin syndicate? Who was in that, uh, the Bitcoin magazine syndicate? Who else at that time that he was working around, did they go off and do different things as well? Um, well, it was not a huge team and really uh, they're, main guy behind that who got Vitalik involved was uh, uh, Mihai uh, Alicia, a uh, really uh, awesome uh, Romanian guy. And uh, he uh, he's working on a really cool project called uh, Akasha, which is a basically a, a blockchain-based social media project. And uh, so, yeah, he's uh, quite passionate about that stuff. Uh, and I'm not so sure about the rest of the team. It was kind of people, lots of people coming and going. But yeah. you know what? There definitely, uh, that early involvement and exposure to crypto and blockchain stuff that gave people the foundation to do so much, right? And and then it was up to each individual. Yeah. And, you know, some people hear these terms thrown around. They don't really know exactly what it means. Yeah. Um, with Ethereum, what can you go over just a little bit? What is it used for now? What do you see some of the uses in the future? For sure. I mean, one analogy, which is still for technical people, but I think many people will understand. If you think back to early uh, websites, right? Like uh, original websites that were built using this technology called HTML, which is called uh, hypertext markup language, which is basically a way to structure your documents. So think about this as a page layout or you know, a language to create page layouts. And that was early websites were they were just pages and you would use that language if you if you want programming language html markup language to create the structure of the page and then you would have a sequence of pages when you click here the new page opens whatever so it was a wonderful start to to the web uh, and it was also very limited because it was really just a sequence of static linked pages that what what it's about and but early on then with a lot of experimentation what happened is that uh, after a lot of experiments with like Flash and Serialite and all kinds of other stuff and Adobe Macromedia, uh, but what became the most common way to build websites is using JavaScript, which is a programming language where you can do any kind of programming stuff. So now when you open, I don't know, facebook.com, this looks just like an app on your computer or on your uh, phone, even though it's a website because it's so dynamic you know you click here and stuff comes up it reacts to you it's not just a sequence of static pages so this is like the analogy like bitcoin was a wonderful technology for managing monitor monetary records you know joe has 100 bitcoins now joe sends one bitcoin to mary and stuff like that this is basically the concept of bitcoin and that record is stored in this distributed ledger all over the world you know 
people keep copies of that and they constantly reconcile them to each other. That's the Bitcoin. So Ethereum was, okay, taking that, but then adding a language on top of that, program a language on top of that, just like JavaScript was added on top of HTML. So now each record, you know, when that uh, transfer happens, then there is some logic, there are some conditions. You can check this, you can execute that. It becomes something you reach. It becomes something much more alive, something much more dynamic. So really from static websites to the modern websites, and that's really what we have as the transition from what Bitcoin was, just records of monetary transfers to this very rich uh, idea of, uh, and they call them smart contracts, but basically it's uh, just uh, it's uh, any kind of uh, transactions which manage your monetary objects, but then they have all kinds of very rich logic to doing that. So, and back to your question, like, what is it used for? It's used for so much stuff now from gaming to uh, art, you know, those NFTs, many people have heard those terms to, I don't know, insurance and uh, uh, reputation systems and uh, actually some really cool projects that uh, uh, in social media. And I do hope, I mean, I'm pretty sure they will succeed it's just a matter of time, but, you know, we will go away from their domination of uh, Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. And, you know, those guys selling our personal data and, you know, pushing all those ads to very different transparent systems. Yeah. I remember watching the, um, uh, that documentary, um, the social dilemma and, Mm. uh, about, about the social media, where do you see it going? What do you see it being used for in the future? I remember when I was talking to Alvy Ray Smith, who started Pixar and he was like, he saw the vision years, years and years later of, he's like, Toy Story. He's like, we don't have the technology now, but we will in right. this this year. Yeah, and mm-hmm. he saw that. And um, yeah. what do you see? Where do you see Ethereum going in the future and, and helping with? One metaphor, one of the metaphor that I can give you is like uh, we are all familiar with notary services, right? Like when you do something, but then you know, a public notary then verifies that what you have done, you know. You have the right documentation. There, there's, you know, maybe you're buying a house and whatever else you're doing. So you can think of Ethereum as this kind of global notary, or, you know, global computing service that you can trust on to uh, execute specific transactions, whether that be purchase of stock, transfer of real estate, execution of, I don't know, some gaming algorithms. And, and so because in the modern world, when you run, when you use some kind of uh, computing system, let's say it's Facebook, let's say your banking system, whatever, you have to rely on some people somewhere taking, you know, running the server and taking care of that software. And that model is actually not that trustworthy because, you know, the years, the decades of using that model, we have realized, yeah, you know what, like people are, they can be corrupted, the systems, they can have all kinds of bugs and there are all kinds of problems with that, right? So uh, your data is, uh, you know, you're using It's the manual and, they, and it's archaic yeah, in a sense. You know? Totally, right? So Ethereum is a replacement for that. So basically it's this, uh, instead of you trusting that some people somewhere run those computers in the proper manner, instead it's a very complex technology that ensures that all of those uh, lines of programming code that you use to for whatever important uh, operations that I mentioned some of them, right? Uh, that they are executed in a transparent manner. You can verify that they have been executed, that they have run exactly the way they should, that its relation has been completed, that you know the ownership has been transferred, and so on and so on. So really, it's a different way to interact with computing system when you have full transparency. Instead of you interacting with Facebook, for example, and having no clue, like, you know, what are they doing with your data? Uh, who are they giving it and so on? Like uh, with their public blockchain based system like Ethereum, uh, then uh, all of this stuff is uh, is verifiable, it's transparent, you can you know keep track of that. You, you decide, it's actually a very different paradigm. Again, like instead of you trusting that some people somewhere, they do a good job of running, you know, those computer systems uh, to handle your data and uh, the, do the processing that you need them to do. Now you become the owner. You have this concept of digital wallet, digital identity, digital ownership. And now you decide, okay, so maybe 
you know, when they ask for this much information, I decide whether to give them or not. And I have visibility into what they're going to do with it and so on. So it's actually the change of this. Uh, there's this term people use, uh, their uh, self-sovereignty. You know, you uh, as a human being, you become the sovereign, the king of your data, your processing, the way you interact with the world versus like having to blindly trust some other central systems, which obviously proved to be very unreliable and very untrustworthy in many, many cases. What's holding back the adoption? It, it is a very, very complex technology because obviously I just described you in a very superficial way what they do, but behind the scenes, there is so much has to happen, right? And, uh, and uh, let me put it this way. Most centralized systems, they are built with some assumptions that there are some ideal humans who are kind and trustworthy and diligent, and they will run those systems. But we are humans. We are not that way, right? Bitcoin succeeded because it was technology built in with very different assumptions. It was built with the assumption that people will try to break it. People will try to steal your money. People will do this and that. And the system was built with assumptions that they will try that. How do we prevent that from happening, right? So uh, modern systems, uh, uh, blockchain-based systems, they kind of have to do that. They build for the assumption that everybody will try to break them to steal your data to be... So they are designed with a very adversarial, if you will, mindset. So there's a lot of complexity. There are a lot of very complex math and cryptography and technology. And it's really hard to do that. Um, like... Uh, uh, properly, because again, like, people are very inventive, right? Some people invent the technology, then a lot of other people try to break it, try to gain, you know, to make some personal gains from that. Um, so, scalability is uh, is uh, is a very big was a very big problem for a long time, and I would say that actually in this year twenty twenty two, we are finally solving the scalability issues, uh, uh, specifically on Ethereum, but you know, there are some other awesome uh, solutions. Uh, that are being built. So, so, so before before this, it was really a system that you could use it uh, for some small project. But as soon as you get in anywhere close to scale, then it becomes too expensive, too slow, and so on. And this is rapidly changing. So, I think we're actually getting to the era of mass adoption of this blockchain-based systems now. Yeah, I think a lot of times in you know, technology sometimes has to catch up, and community sometimes has to catch up um, totally. to make things happen. Yeah. Of course, right? And we have to get used to the fact that, uh, again, like, you know, this new breakthrough thing happens. Like, again, look, think back to the birth of uh, web, right? And there were dot com, and then there was dot com bust, and all of this stuff. And in crypto, we've seen all of that. We see so much cool stuff being built. And then also all of this speculation, all of this scamming, all of this stuff. So then people, who use those systems, they have to learn this new concept. They have also to uh, understand their own desire to get rich quick and the risks that come with that and you know their own interaction and, and their own attraction to that crazy speculation and gambling and whatnot that's happening on, on some of those systems. You know, one thing you talk about is some of the, the challenges and things you're trying to solve for in general in the, in the community is you've talked about the fees. Can you talk yeah. about your thoughts on that? For sure. I mean, it's a people talk about uh, <clears throat> uh, fees, right? Which is basically when you use this, uh, you can think of Ethereum and similar system as public service. So when you use them, then uh, the way it works is that for you to use a public service, somebody has to provide the public service. So for that public service to be provided, then again, why would people provide those? Uh, uh, computing facilities, right? And in Bitcoin, they're called miners. In Ethereum, they're called validators. Basically, people, uh, people companies, organizations, whatever, uh, those who provide the resources to uh, to run the, the actual system, right? And they have to be compensated. Uh, so there has to be fees for running the system. And it's also um, when people have made a number of attempts trying to get around this. But end of the day, when they try to build a system without that, then what happens is like, if every transaction has a chance, every transaction is free and they all get a chance to compete with each other, 
then immediately all those bots, all those uh, spammers and scammers and whatnot, they just flood the system because they don't care. It doesn't cost them anything to, to do that. So they just flood the system with millions of transactions. So there was, there was no way uh, around the fact that to use this public service, you have to pay a fee. Mm. Now, beyond this question, like, you know, how large is the fee? How do you regulate it in, uh, in relation to the demand? That's a big issue. And this is something that uh, uh, really smart people have been working on for a long, long time. And actually, this year, probably in, in August, Ethereum will be making a major transition to a different algorithm used to run the system and from uh, the system that is similar to what Bitcoin uses called proof of work, the new system called uh, proof of stake. And that system actually decreases their energy consumption by a factor of uh, hundreds of times. So I'm really excited about that fact. And mm -hmm. it also creates a foundation for uh, lowering the fees on the system as the dem demand keeps uh, uh, skyrocketing, right? Like, uh, and at the end of the day, again, these systems, they are really built around very simple principles and connected to entrepreneurship. You know, growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, entrepreneurship was not something that I understood because it just like wasn't there. There's the centralized state, which was supposed to provide services and goods, and they were totally failing because there was no motivation. So eventually, I understood entrepreneurship as, uh, okay, you know what? You build some solutions, you solve problems for the people, you get rewarded for that. Very simple, right? So the same thing here is like systems like uh, Ethereum. The question is like, is there demand for them? Well, nowadays on a daily basis, people spend about $10 million on fees to use the system. So it's worth that for them, that much. And you know, it goes up and down. So this, there is obviously, we it's well established by now that people do want this kind of service. They want this uh, trustworthy decentralized system they can that can, run their, you know, those uh, kind of, uh, if you will, automated uh, uh, legal transactions, if you will, right? That's what smart contracts are. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the current stage where we are. And I think from here on, we really enter in the, you know, the mass adoption times. You know, talk about, you started um, Block Geeks with Amir Rosick. Yeah. Um, talk about what was the original idea uh, for that? Um, very simple, right? Because, yeah, we started that uh, in 2016. Oh, my God, time flies, right? Six years ago. Um, and uh, back then, it was already clear to us that uh, uh, the technology was well, way less developed than it is now. But it would, it, we firmly believe, and I think that uh, our, belief, uh, definitely, uh, our beliefs definitely played out, that uh, this is where the world is going, that, you know, uh, all of the modern, you know, most of the modern uh, technological systems will end up going toward using those decentralized blockchain-based systems just because we are really, if you will, we're just becoming realistic. We are uh, realizing just like, you know, in the early days of computing, nobody thought about security because like, yeah, of course, people just want to use computers to do good stuff, Right. But no, people have all kinds of motivations that you want to make personal gains, they want to do, they want to get advantage, this and that. So the whole so security was something that was added to computing systems much later on. So if you will, we're now witnessing a similar scale of uh, you know, revolution when we realized, you know what, we cannot trust that some people, uh, I, don't know, I don't know Mark Zuckerberg, but maybe he's a totally upstand guy, but basically trusting all of my personal data in interaction to that he has all, only good intentions and my, at his heart and, you know, has the right capability and teams and systems. It's like, it's becoming obvious that this is not how the world works, right? So it was very clear that uh, blockchain-based systems, which do not assume trust, but again, you know, they assume that there will be other people trying to break the system to take advantage, you know, still, and, and so on. So let's design the systems for that. Let's design the systems for this, for the real world. So I, it was clear to us that that's where we're going. We started this education company and we had some ups and downs in terms of like who we serve and who's on or whatnot. But the overall direction, the overall concept is definitely uh, uh, played out. Yeah, talk about the evolution for a second. So originally you wanted to educate people on, um, you know, 
blockchain and the different things. There's you know course free courses here and guides. Yeah. Um, but you uh, you the evolved. Original, yeah, yeah. The original thinking was really about educating more developers because back then it was still a very limited, very small community of uh, people building those kind of systems. So the focus was on uh, uh, technical information. That's what we did for their first few years of the business. But eventually we realized that like neither Amir nor myself are developers. And also there are lots of other services and developers are smart guys. You know, they actually figure out uh, the so many ways for them to learn this stuff. So eventually we changed uh, uh, our direction and we now mostly really focusing on people new to this blockchain technology, not in terms of building stuff, but in terms of using that, right? What kind of wallets do you use? Like which exchange do you trust? Like, you know, how do you pick between all these different blockchains? So kind of like, you know, try the basics, the foundations. So really supporting this whole, the current, uh, uh, phase of uh, uh, what I refer to as mass adoption of uh, blockchain tech and, you know, what I refer to as Web3. What are some resources you recommend, Dima, either podcasts or sites um, in this space? Um, I would say number one for me is a, a podcast called Bankless. Those guys uh, do an awesome job. They have, you know, newsletter, they have a podcast uh, and they provide, you know, everything from giving you a big picture, why we're doing this, what is good about this, to actually all their detailed specific recommendations like uh, investigating different technologies and cryptocurrencies and systems and so on. So yeah, Bankless would be my, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the website is banklesshq.com if I'm not mistaken. Any conferences that you've been going to in the, uh, in the space? I mostly, you know, when I do go, I mostly go to Ethereum conferences because I really resonate with the Ethereum community. It's a community full of really smart people who are also very passionate about the stuff they're building because, you know, some other conferences, I go there and I get a sense that that's really a lot of uh, uh, money grabbing. And, and on the one hand, there is nothing wrong with that because obviously, uh, it's a very natural desire for human beings to survive and they try to get as much resource and their futile hope that maybe they will stay immortal or some kind of bullshit like that. <laughs> but yeah, very, very often that actually gets uh, way over extended into just like everything for me, for me, just for me, right? But uh, that, is, that is not the vibe that I get from the Ethereum community. And again, there are all kinds of people there for sure, right? But in general, these are people who are very, passionate and if you will idealistic and all extremely technically smart people who are building this infrastructure for the world to use this is the the driver for people so yeah ethereum then has a number of conferences they have this uh, local conferences they have a global conference happening once a year in different uh, localities because also it's a very international community like for example bitcoin used to be very us centric probably still is to a large degree and ethereum is much more international you know there are all kinds of you know things happening so if you just look for things like ethereum conferences so there is a wonderful organization called eth global um that's a wonderful source uh, you, where you can find uh, information about the upcoming conferences yeah yeah and people could check out um you have a bunch of updated links and and resources too if you look at go to if you're watching the video buterin.com uh, you have a bunch of uh, resources yeah, here the, as there's well. There's a bunch of uh, yeah. my recent interviews and, and stuff like that. And then there is just some background information about me and some of my life philosophy and stuff like that. Um, do you might go to your LinkedIn page and I see this image um, if you're <laughs> watching the video. So talk, talk <laughs> about this image and if you're listening to the audio you'll just have to go to the video to, yeah. to see what i'm looking at but i'll describe it's kind of like a greenish alien looking character tell, tell yeah. me about this yes um i'll give you a couple of perspectives on this one is uh, for a long time again like we've tried to build businesses with a concept of this is business. This is personal. Let's try to separate them, right? I don't buy this bullshit. Like, you know, human is human. Uh, what's happening with you and your family and your life will affect your work. What's happening at your work will affect your personal life. So for me, they're just like aspects of the same indivisible human. So 
I, I really, th- that's the way I've been building businesses. And that's the way I always look to connect with people and support them and building businesses. It's like, let's support the whole human, including having fun, right? So LinkedIn is supposedly for businesses staff and people there, they're, they have to look confident and important in the business suits and whatnot. Okay, look at this green dude, and uh, he he's uh, uh, he's got a uh, marijuana leaf somewhere in him, and uh, an Ethereum and whatnot. So this is really a reflection of my personal philosophy that life is a whole thing, and you know it's important to have fun whatever business you're doing. And actually, I would say that most businesses that do pretend to be so wonderful and formal and so professional, they are full of bullshit and scam and greed and fakeness, right? And, you know, so so that's one perspective. Another perspective, I mean, this is originally an NFT, a non-fungible to- topic, uh, non-fungible token, which is, uh, if you will, uh, in a simplified way, digital art, right? Uh, just like uh, we over the years learned to <clears throat> deal with their money through blockchain technology, and now we're dealing with art. Uh, the provenance of art. And actually, I stayed away from NFTs for a long time because I just like couldn't quite get it. And then I tried uh, for the last time, maybe about a year ago. And then I started playing with that. And then I discovered the whole world of wonderful digital artists creating fun images, impactful images, passionate images, and the art, whether that being, you know, those uh, profile images, just the digital art and stuff like that. And ended up for collecting over a thousand NFT uh, art pieces, if you will, and and really kind of got to understand that uh, it's really about so many human things. It's not about just digital this and that, but it's about having fun. It's about uh, showing off, like instead of a Lambo, people now have those, uh, I, I never got into those specifically, but those bored apes things which sell for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And that's really... It's all about us humans just trying to be significant, right? So there's that. It's also about connection, right? People become parts of those tribes. So I'm a tribe of, you know, this bored ape. So no, I'm with penguins and this and that. So <laughs> so kind of like playing with that and investigating all of that space was really amazing. And most recently with the war in Ukraine, uh, there was a quite a lot of fundraising being done by uh, through digital art and some really cool project based on NFT, which fundraised millions, tens of millions of dollars actually through uh, through NFT technology. So that was really amazing to see. Have you found people are integrating physical objects with the digital NFT um, as rewards or things like that? And, and I ask that because I think it'd be a cool reward for maybe gate.org like maybe there's an nft ukraine project and people get three signed bitcoin magazines from vitalik or something as a reward i wonder how that would that would be cool i've seen a bunch of attempts and projects i have not seen anything succeed at large scale but i think there is some really cool stuff and just recently there was this project being discussed like uh some people are thinking of uh uh as you know, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine was able to destroy a lot of uh, uh, Russian army equipment, including tanks. So people are talking about getting one of those destroyed Russian tanks, cutting them into a lot of small pieces, and actually selling NFTs for, for that as a ver- verified uh, you know, mm. provenance of that. But then also people would get uh, a piece of actual blown up Russian tank as a part of their the nation support of this initiative. So this is just like one example. Amazing. Steve, I want to be the first one to thank you. Uh, Thanks for sharing your knowledge and stories. This has been amazing. I want to encourage people to go to gate.org. Also, you can check out buterin.com and more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. And Dima, thanks for joining me. Yeah, good to talk to you, Jeremy. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, nice like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand